الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Respected brothers, elders, sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله uh, Today I want to speak about one of the greatest journeys in the history of Islam. And that is the journey of Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu going to Jerusalem to pick up the keys from the patriarch. See Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah says, وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا And you will not find a change to the patterns and the manners of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gives preference to certain things over other things. So Allah is the creator of all human beings, but then amongst the human beings, Allah has chosen the Anbiya alayhi salatu salam, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So he's given preference to certain things over others, although he's the creator of everything. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates time and space. But there are certain times which are more virtuous over certain other times, like today, the day of Jummah, is the best day of the week. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the nights, but the last 10 nights of Ramadan are the most holiest nights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates days, but the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah are regarded as the most holiest days and the day of Arafah better than all the other days. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates time, hours, minutes, seconds. On the day of Jummah, there is an hour, a minute, a second, a period in which a dua is accepted more than other times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a portion of the night where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest heaven to ask his abd and his slave, what do they wish for? So although Allah creates all time and space, there is certain times which are better than others. Similarly, Allah has created the earth, but there are certain portions within the earth which are better than others. The most holiest is the Haram in Mecca, which is the most holiest masjid, the most holiest space. Interestingly, since the Muslims went to Mecca, Fateh Mecca, returned to Mecca, uncontested, it has been in the hands of the Muslims. Medina, second most holiest place. Since the Muslims went into Medina, and they created their constitution, Medina has for the last 1400 years, been uncontestedly in the hands of the Muslims. Then we go to the third most holiest place to the believers. There is no place on the face of this earth which is as contested as Jerusalem. The Jews, the Christians, the Muslims all hold, all claim stake to it. On the face of this earth, there is no place which is more contested than this. And really to understand today's conflict, you have to look into history. This is nothing new. The longest battle in the history of humanity is the Crusades. Crusades lasted for 200 years. You know how many Christians died in the Crusades? Six million Christians died in the Crusades. These weren't people who lived over there. No, these, the vast majority of these people were people who traveled from the west, from here, all the way to the east, no planes, no ships. Vast majority of them either walked or they went on a mount. Six million Christians died. It is regarded as the longest battle in the history of humanity recorded. And then we had Salahuddin Rahimahullah, the king who stayed more in his tent than he stayed in his palace. And he liberated Masjid al-Aqsa, he liberated Jerusalem 80 years, 80 years after the demise of Salahuddin. 
his own family, the Ayyubites. Yusuf and Nasir were drawing deals with the Christians and saying to the Christians, I will give you Jerusalem back on one condition, just 80 years after Salahuddin's sacrifice. On one condition that you help us fight the Mamluks in Egypt and we will give you Masjid al-Aqsa and everything with it. 80 years. Mongols, you know the history of Mongols? They decimated the Muslim world. Even the Mongols were cutting deals with the Christians and saying that if you help us fight the Muslims, we will give you Jerusalem. <coughs> Have you, what does the year 1492 mean to you? 1492 is the year where the Muslims lost Granada, the final place in Andalus. 1492. After 800 years of ruling, 800 years of ruling, now the Muslims had to give the keys back to the Alhambra Palace, that beautiful palace in Granada. At times being the most powerful force on the face of this earth, the Muslims in, in, in Andalus. You know when Abu Abdullah gave the key back to Isabella and Ferdinand, you know who was there? 1st of January 1492, after 800 years of dominance, Christopher Columbus was there. It was at the end of 1492 that Christopher Columbus reached the Americas. Same year, with the help of Muslim and Jewish navigators. The next year, 1493, Christopher Columbus wrote a letter to Isabella and Ferdinand, and he said, give me... Give me five years and I will bring an army to you, which will comprise of 50,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry. With what purpose? He's sitting in America. He's writing a letter to Spain. What purpose? He says one purpose and that purpose is to liberate Jerusalem. Even Christopher Columbus had his eyes on Jerusalem. Have you ever heard of a man called Imam Shamil? Imam Shamil is known as the Salahuddin of the Caucasus. Why is he known as the Salahuddin of the Caucasus? Because Nicholas Tsar wanted to take the Caucasus. So from Russia, he was the most powerful, possibly most powerful man on the face of this earth. He wanted to, from here, from Russia, he wanted to take Jerusalem. But the problem was that he had to go past the Caucasus, for over 20 years, Imam Shamil, rahimahullah, bogged him down, pinned him down. He couldn't reach the, he couldn't get past the Caucasus, let alone Jerusalem. And this is why Imam Shamil, rahimahullah, is known as the Salahuddin of the Caucasus. Now, this and much, much more. This is just a small portion of history regarding Masjid al-Aqsa. So if you understand this, then you understand the context of what is happening today. This is the most contested place on the face of this earth. And sometimes, you know, when Muslims see what's going on, they think, never is it going to be liberated. And they lose heart. You know, Salahuddin, rahimahullah, liberated Masjid al-Aqsa after 80 years. Today, it's only been over 60 years. So believers should always have this belief that everything is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is nowhere a greater example than this in the life of the Prophet sallallahu Now imagine this. Within the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have the largest army to ever march on Medina. Never had they ever had an army larger than this, 11,000. The Muslims were 3,000. Out of the 3,000, 2,000 were true believers, 1,000 were munafiqeen. The only way that you could enter Medina were two ways. Either you entered the front or either you entered the rear. But the rear was covered by the Bani Quraidah, who initially the Muslims had a treaty with. On the side, Medina has lavas. So you can't actually enter Medina from the sides. So Salman al-Farsi, the Persian, comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says the message of Allah we, the Persians, because the Persians were the superpower of the time, when we 
have an issue like this and an army we can't deal with, what we do is that we dig trenches. So the Messenger of Allah commanded the Sahaba radiallahu anhu to dig the trench. Now imagine this, it's mid-winter. The Muslims haven't eaten anything for days. There's a famine going on. The Sahaba come to the Prophet sallallahu and they say, Oh Messenger of Allah, we're hungry. We're so hungry that they remove their garment from the stomach and they have a stone tied to their stomach. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu removes his garment and he has two stones tied to his stomach. Then they come while they're digging this trench, they come to this big rock, this boulder, and they can't break it. So they come to the Prophet sallallahu and they say, Oh Messenger of Allah, we can't break the boulder. So the Messenger of Allah, look at this, he's over 50 years old at the time. There are many younger Sahaba, many big Sahaba, but none of them can break it. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who has two stones tied to his stomach, goes. So he goes, he takes the pickaxe and he strikes it. And the third of it breaks and there's a huge spark and he says, Allahu Akbar. Then he strikes it again, another third breaks and there's a huge spark and he says, Allahu Akbar. And then he strikes it the third time and there's a huge spark. And the Messenger of Allah says, Allahu Akbar. And the Sahaba say, oh, Messenger of Allah, what was the Allahu Akbar about? We've never seen that before. What was that spark? So the Prophet Sallallahu said, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala showed me that through the spark, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala showed me that a day would come that we would take the palaces of Yemen. And then when we struck it the second time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me that a day would come through the spark that we would take the palaces of Sham, the Byzantines, who ruled all the way from Istanbul and into Eastern Europe, all the way into Sham, the entirety of Sham, which is classically Lebanon, Palestine, uh, uh, Jordan, and Syria, and uh, slightly other places. They ruled all that. And he said, a day, Allah showed me a day would come that we would take the palaces of Sham. And then he said, when I struck it the third time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me that a day would come that we would take the white palace of the superpower of the day, the Persians. So imagine this. You got an army on the other side. You've never had an army so large ever. The Abu Sufyan was saying, who was in charge of the uh, army on the other side, he said, this is the final battle after today, the Muslim would never stand. And they reach there, they reach a trench. You got nothing to eat. If there's a famine going on, it's midwinter. And the Prophet Sallallahu is telling them a day would come that they will take all these places. So the Munafiqeen began to say, look at this guy. He's promising them that they will become a superpower of the day. And one of us is scared and to go and relieve himself. Within a period of 10 years approximately, those very hungry, scared Muslims became the superpower of the day. They became the superpower of the day. So it shows you that never become despondent because if you have Allah, you have everything. And if you lose Allah, you lose everything. Within the lifetime, you know, and where, where, where is this? So when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said a day will come that you will take Sham, well, Masjid Al-Aqsa is in Sham. So in the darkest moment, the Messenger of Allah promised them that a day would come that you will take Masjid Al-Aqsa. Let me tell you about another ajeeb incident in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Bukhari mentions this in Kitabul Iman. It's a very long hadith. Heraclius was the leader of the Byzantine, the Eastern Europeans. And Heraclius came to Jerusalem for a pilgrimage. This was his, you know, this was a defining moment because he had just defeated the Persians. He was elated. He had bought the true cross just to leave. This was the most holiest relic. Just to leave that in Jerusalem, he came for this pilgrimage. Whilst he's in Jerusalem, he has a dream. Imam Bukhari mentioned this, Ajib. He says he has a dream that he sees through the stars, because he's an astrologer, that a day will come that a group of people will take this land. So he wakes up very uncomfortable, very perturbed. 
So they ask him what's wrong and he says, I've had this dream and I couldn't get to sleep after that. Hasn't combed his hair, looks real mess. He said, one sign of these people is that they are people who have been circumcised. So they say, said, the only group of people we know who are circumcised are the Jews. They said, no problem, we'll wipe them all out. There's not many Jews. At that very time, the Prophet ﷺ sent out the letters to the leaders to invite them towards Islam. And he receives the letter of the Prophet ﷺ inviting him towards Islam. So he says, who is this man? They said, oh, he's a man who lives in the Arab Peninsula and he regards himself as a prophet. Now he's intrigued. So he said, is there any of his people in Jerusalem? La ilaha illallah. At that very time, Abu Sufyan happened to be in Jerusalem. Who was Abu Sufyan? Abu Sufyan was the leader of Quraysh. In every single battle against the Muslims, Abu Sufyan was in charge of the army besides one battle, and that was the Battle of Badr. And why wasn't he in charge of that? Because he was in charge of the caravan which the Muslims were trying to intercept. So therefore, he couldn't be a part. Every other battle, he's in charge. So Heraclius calls him and he calls the entire caravan. And he says, who is the closest in family to this man, Muhammad? So Abu Sufyan says, I am. So he says, so you come forward. And he says to the rest of his caravan, he says, if he lies, you just indicate to me he's lied. Just do a shara and I will understand that he's lied. Abu Sufyan says, by Allah, if it was not for the sake that people would have called me a liar, I would have lied regarding Muhammad. That's how much he hated the Prophet Sallallahu so Heraclius now says, he's asking him a, a number of questions. He tells the translator, he said, ask him, this man, what kind of family does he belong to? He said, he belongs to a very noble family. He said, I want to ask you, did any of his forefathers regard themselves as kings? He said, no. He said, did any of his forefathers claim that they were prophets? He said, no. He said, I want to ask you, what kind of people follow him? The high, the noble, or the untouchables? The poor, the masakin, the slaves. He said, the untouchables. He said, I want to ask you, do their numbers increase or do their numbers decrease? He said, their numbers increase. He said, do any of them turn away from the religion after they have embraced the religion? He said, no, none of them ever turn away from religion. I want to ask you, did he lie before prophethood? He said, no. He said, has he ever broken his prophet before prophethood? He said, no. Now Abu Sufyan says, here I had got a chance, because this was after Sulul Hudaybiyah. And I said to him, he said, I got a chance to slip what I wanted to say. I said, he's never broken his promise, but because we now have a treaty, he may break his promise now. He said to him, do you have wars? He said, yes. He said, who wins the wars? He said, sometimes we win the wars, sometimes they win the wars. One day is for us, one day is for you, and this is how it is. Because if every day the Muslims won, which at the moment we're not having a very good day, if everybody, every day the Muslims won, everybody would be a Muslim. So he said, one day for us, one day for them. He said, what does he command you to do? He said, he commands us to worship Allah and do not prescribe partners unto him. He, he tells us to pray. It tells us to forsake the religion of our forefathers. It tells us that we should be chaste, we should be good to our neighbors. So then Heraclius says to the translator, translate for him. Heraclius says, I ask you, what kind of family he comes from? You said he comes from a noble family. He said, every single Nabi come from a noble family. I ask you, did any of his forefathers claim that they were prophets or kings? You said no. I would have said possibly if he claimed himself as a prophet because his forefathers claimed they were prophets, he just wanted to claim the stake of his forefathers. He just wanted to be a king or a prophet like his forefathers. You said no. I ask you, what kind of people follow him? La ilaha illallah. You said those people who are poor follow him, the untouchable. He said every Nabi, listen to this, every single Nabi is initially followed by poor people. The untouchables. The rich are not interested. Why? Because they're too good. They're always followed by the poor people. 
And this is why you see the people who are around the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Vast majority were either who had no security from Quraysh or they were slaves. That's the kind of people. He said, I ask you, do their numbers increase or decrease? You said their numbers increase. He said, that is the nature of Iman. He said, I ask you, do anybody turn away from the religion after they have embraced the religion? You said none of them ever turn away from the religion. He said, when the sweetness of Iman enters the heart, nobody ever turns away from it. I ask you, did this man lie or break his promises before prophethood? You said no. Then I want to ask you a question. If a man was not ready to lie to other people, why would he lie about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I asked you about wars. You said sometimes they win, sometimes we win. He said that's how it happens. I asked you about what does he command you to do and you told me this is what he commands you to do. He said every Nabi comes with this very dawah that you worship Allah and do not prescribe partners unto him. That you pray, you be chased, etc, etc. And then Heraclius said, he said, by Allah, if you are speaking the truth, then a day will come that this very place where I stand today, this man Muhammad will conquer that which is beneath my feet. Abu Sufyan was taken aback. This is a narration related by Imam Bukhari in Kitabul Iman. Abu Sufyan says that the leader of Bani Asfar, Bani Asfar were the yellow one because they referred to the Europeans as the yellow one. He said the leader of Bani Asfar is even impressed by this man Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So within the lifetime of the Prophet wasallam, you have all these things happening. The Messenger of Allah said, the signs, the first sign of the hour is my death. He said, the second sign of the hour is the conquest of Masjid al-Aqsa. Within the lifetime, and I will speak about this inshallah in more detail next week. Within his lifetime, look at these words of the Prophet wasallam. The Messenger of Allah wasallam said, he said, pray, pray two rakats in Masjid al-Aqsa. And if you cannot pray two rakats in Masjid al-Aqsa, then send oil to be burnt in the lantern in Masjid al-Aqsa. Pray two rakats in Masjid al-Aqsa. And if you cannot, within his lifetime, and if you cannot pray two rakats in Masjid al-Aqsa, then send oil to be burnt in his lantern. Really interesting. I'll tell you why it's really interesting. Because the Muslims never conquered Masjid al-Aqsa in the life of the Prophet sallallahu He's prophesizing that a day will come that you will take Masjid al-Aqsa. And then he said, send oil to be burnt in its lantern. What does it mean? When was it conquered? Inshallah, Allah willing, next week I will cover, inshallah, the rest of the history of the conquest of Masjid al-Aqsa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Elevate our brothers and sisters who are defending our third most holiest site. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate Masjid al-Aqsa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create a million salahuddin in this ummah who have a fiqr for Masjid al-Aqsa. Barakallahu feekum.